What is up everybody? Welcome to this week's Jesse Spec YouTube video. After a long wait, we're gonna jump back into the MR2 content. I know lots of you have been waiting for that. There has been a lot of action going on with the MR2 recently, including a good four hours tuning session on the dyno, and I brushed up a little bit the tuning of the car. So today's episode is gonna walk you through what I did and the gains that I could make. So without further ado, join me and let's dive right into it. All right, we're back at the office. All right, we're back at the warehouse. As you can see here, we're diving back into MR2 content. And this video is just to give you a little an update of what is going on on the MR2. So as you said, as you saw last time, I managed to make 199.2 or something horsepower at the engine with uh, three or four hours of uh, tuning. I did all the steady state AFR, ignition and VVTi and the car was running pretty good. And I also wanted to compare it to see how it was, how it actually runs compared to the stock Corolla when I once uh, started the whole project. Remember in one of my early episodes, my first episode actually, I made a compare, uh, an explanation why I want to take the 2ZZ and put it into an MR2. And I actually dyno the Corolla and everything in its form without even maintenance, nothing. And it made 189 or 190 horsepower. And so I picked up 10 horsepower. Um, but what's a little bit confusing is I was expecting honestly to make more horsepower than that. And honestly, it's harder to pick up horsepower than I thought. Um, also, I've run into an interesting case is even by over advancing uh, ignition times, I haven't been running into knock. So that really shows that um, this engine is at least up high. I don't think it's knock limited. So getting good torque will probably be uh, before the knock appears. So that's something also that is a bit confusing since I do a lot of turbo cars. We usually just run into knock before we actually have maximum torque. So it's a different approach and I've been playing around with it. And of course, when you have VVTi also, uh, how much, how many degrees VVTi you choose, it will influence AFRs. So that's also something that I have been running into and it makes things a little bit uh, more complicated. So imagine like, let's say I, up top, I wanna decrease VVTi timing in order to have uh, try to gain a little bit more horsepower, uh, the the AFRs will change. So at that moment, I have to recalibrate AFRs, and of course, uh, if AFRs change, knock can also be influenced. Uh, if it gets leaner, knock might show up quicker with the current ignition times. So uh, as you can imagine, those are three variables that get pretty complicated to do it's really super consistent it always cuts off at 199.99 i got close to 200 but since i've been trying out so many different settings i'm really starting to think that i have a restriction somewhere so one thing i want to do if we think about it once again i have a 2zz with a 1zz fujitsubo exhaust and a swap header and decat i have a air filter intake uh, and that's roughly about it. So what I'm thinking is let's try a few interesting things and see if there's something wrong with my tuning, which I hope not. Or is it mechanical stuff limiting me or is there electrical stuff limiting me? So the three things I would like to do, first of all, is let's run the MR2 with the stock ECU see what happens and I would like to see if by running it with the stock ECU I get the same horsepower or less and also I can compare it to when it was in the Corolla you know with a because Corolla since it's FF they have a straight exhaust they don't have the MR2 rotating one going around so that is one thing I want to try the other thing I want to try is does changing the air filter position because in the comments some of you guys have told me my air intake 
was just going out sideways uh, towards the exhaust. I mean, not too close, but still it was getting there. So does changing the orientation of this uh, make a difference? And uh, you will see, I will show you the videos. It's uh, surprising. Honestly, I thought it would be more of a big difference. And finally, if all of these things don't work, is it just me and do I have to just put more effort in tuning it? So, of course, at any moment, to you guys who actually know what you're talking about out there, if you have any tips or if you have any ideas on how to improve the tuning or is it really mechanical restriction, exhaust flow or the intake or something like that, let's let's give it a try and let's see okay so let's first of all get started and put the stock ECU in the car oh my god am i turning into a vlogger no don't worry this is just for practical reasons so today there's another thing i wanted to show you i've changed a little bit my dyno setup so as you know dynapack dyno users when you do a lot of steady state tuning you run into the issue where these pods that you can see here actually overheat because you have 90 liters of oil in it and that means you have downtime the car is on the dyno but you cannot uh, continue tuning so i've created a system usually you have uh, water hoses that you can hook up here let me just show focus on that so you can hook up water hoses and many fellow tuners actually just use fresh water and throw away the water and I think that's honestly a waste uh, I'm not a tree hugger or anything but honestly I just don't like wasting and uh, water is doesn't cost hardly anything so it's not a financial thing it's just yeah I don't feel like w nowadays wasting water is a good idea so what I do is I created a little system so let me show you that system and let's take a look at it so as you can see here we have the pods and we have right here we have two hoses, an intake and the return for fresh water. So usually people hook it up to fresh water. And what I built is I got a rainwater um, recuperation tank. This is 280 liters, something like that. And I've made a system on a pallet that I can move around because as you can see, we're in a pretty tight space here. So I like having options to move things around it's a very Japanese way of thinking but like that I can save space so I modified the pallet cut it short installed this and so here you have both returns and if I turn this system on you have water that circulates that comes out through here goes into a pump comes out through this hose and then goes into a t-tube that goes into both pods after and then they both find their ways back into the tank here. So it's a little contraption I made and honestly I could double if not triple my dyno sessions without having overheating issues, which is really practical. I might actually push it a step further and actually uh, add a radiator. Let me turn off this because it's pretty noisy. So, so the other idea I had is coming out of the tank here through this hose instead of going directly into the pods I circulate around here and I install an aluminum radiator here and then I come back into this hose and go into both pods so that's just something I am thinking if really high power and lots of steady state tuning is necessary I will be doing that so that's just to show you something cool that I've been working on as well behind the scenes. So as usual, I always use external knock detection. I put it on the block right down here. I don't know if we can see something, probably not so well, but basically it's just down here. I put it against the block. I have my wideband sensor from the dyno that I took right away into the exhaust header right here. And as you can see, I changed where the intake filter is. Now it's behind the battery tray. It used to be right here, as you can see. So I freed that up and I put it in the back. So now you can see fresh air will be able to come 
in through the side vents that we have here. Okay, here we go. From the bottom you can see it. So basically through that vent here, we have the air filter right away. So definitely under dynamic situations, this will improve airflow and increase also fresh airflow, I should say. But honestly, um, the dyno numbers don't speak for themselves. I've come to the conclusion that even if from a heat perspective, this is all heat wrapped. So I've done hours of dyno here right now and it's still, I can touch it because it's well heat wrapped. But of course, if the air filter was situated here before, it's pretty close to the temperature. So of course, when the hood is closed and everything, that will have an impact. So to be honest, on the dyno, there has been no difference. I haven't picked up any horsepower thanks to that. Even if you can see the airflow is considerably uh, better thanks to putting it behind to the battery and that's thanks to some of you guys who actually have given me this idea. So as you can see it's going straight instead of coming out through here. So that's something I highly recommend to do. But honestly since I run the car anyway with an open hood there hasn't been much improvement in that aspect because the, as I said the exhaust is wrapped and on top of that the 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 hood is open so it has less of an impact but on racetrack I'm sure this will have positive positive impact on the whole thing all right let's get back on the dyno and install the stock ECU and let's see if that changes anything from a performance perspective here's the stock ECU let's put it in and just see if we have different figures on the dyno is it my tuning that is making problems or is it something mechanical? Let's take a look. I've also acquired something cool. This will help for making my driving videos as well. Not have too much jittery footage. This baby was expensive, but it will definitely improve the quality of the video. So let's test it right now by putting it against the window in the MR. Okay, I'm in the MR2 now. Let's give it a run with the stock ECU and see if it's my tuning that is has to be checked or is it a mechanical failure. This is something good to do since uh, why I think this is a good idea is also because you know the the airflow the I've opened the transmission, I've done all kinds of things I've taken everything apart, so I think it's smart also since I've uh, retouched the engine and everything just to, you know, have, be, have peace of mind and make sure and take a new baseline for all the tuning I'm doing once the 2ZZ is in the car with the stock ECU. I think it's a smarter thing to do than to compare it to the Corolla because also airflow and various things you know the engine is in the back and everything so it might have some influence on that so this is why i'm planning to swap it out and before i go any further and spend hours on tuning make sure just to have a solid baseline that is actually realistic and from there i'll start improving and if i see that the car makes more power with this ecu then i really have to make sure get my facts together and question myself a bit but anyway let's figure that out apexi ecu out stock ecu in and it's in okay let's give it a try okay the ecu is in Get the car up and running. I have a battery lamp showing up here. AFRs seem pretty okay. All right, it's a bit lean. Anyway, let's give it a try and see. Pretty lean, like 
like that, to be honest. I'll give it a little try. We should be at AFR 14.7. And I don't know if you can see it over here. On my white band here, it says 15.6. So that is lean. That is too lean for us. So we're 5% lean, basically. Anyway, let's give it a little run, see if up top it evens itself out or not. Just need to make sure we have enough airflow. Okay, so I'm gonna launch it and let's check it out. Alright, we see that the horsepower figures are consistent with the stock ECU that we had back then when the engine was in the Corolla. However, I can see that weird enough, the AFRs are all over the place. So that has to do probably with my intake system that is changing a little bit. The scaling must be a little bit off due to that. And this is why AFRs are all over the place and not consistent, which is a bit worrisome. And this is also why it's important to have a power FC or a programmable ECU to have a custom tuned ECU to your current setup in order to have consistent and safe AFRs at all times. And this is why I'm happy to see what I read in the graphs here because it actually makes sense and really explains why it's important to have a programmable ECU when you swap the engine. I'm not saying it's not gonna work with the stock ECU. I can just say that in my current setup, DCAT and all that it shows that it's not working perfectly with the stock ECU so from there I'm gonna continue and um, Try to extract more horsepower actually by playing with the VVTLI. So let's give that a try Okay, let's get back into it. So as you can see here on the graph right now the car made roughly 190 horsepower with the stock ECU and honestly the more runs I did, the lower it got, so it wasn't very consistent. So I put back the Power FC, and as you can see right away, we're back at our 199.25 with my previous tuning. And it's from there that I'm going to start working on the new performance. And I started working my VBTI. I had, of course, AFRs moving, so I had to compensate each time. But you can see that already there, I could make big gains within VBTI on the big cam so I could get a fair gain you can also see that I've done six runs back to back and I've been having 205 horsepower very consistently so I'm proud to say that I I guess my tune roughly increased the power of 15 horsepower so there's definitely power to be made and you know tuning is always the same thing you always get new ideas and you always get back to it so now that I recorded this videos I have already new ideas how to pr improve it further so let's see what we can pick up next time and it's important to note also that my exhaust temps have not exceeded 690 degrees even run after run so i'm really happy with that which means we're in a nice safe zone okay we're back in the office so let's conclude this video as you can see tuning an NA car or the 2ZZ for example is actually not the easiest car to tune in all honesty. Um, as I said, you know, one thing I maybe didn't say in the video is that actually when tuning uh, the, the VVT-I part of things, you actually always upset the AFRs you actually set. So you cannot just change the, the VVT-I setting and think that your engine is going to run on your AFR target. It actually totally changes everything. So that's actually pretty annoying because in the end you have to constantly readjust. You actually also, the theory would be also that you have to redo ignition each time that you do a change as well. And of course, always monitor knock and everything. So this process was really long and I'm happy. I basically, my tune is let's say about 15 horsepower increase over the stock ECU. So I'm pretty happy. And um, from there, basically, there is a little bit more in it. Could be like maybe two or three horsepower more, but I'm really getting to the upper limit here. And 
yeah and it was really fun and so let's conclude uh, the final remarks also regarding the intake so just so this doesn't come off wrong in the video you know the air intake i put it in a different way behind the battery and as you can imagine with an open trunk or hood it will make almost no difference because there's plenty of fresh air in the engine bay since it's open what i was more interested is to see was there actually a flow difference between having a 90 degree bend in your intake rather than just a very slight uh, maybe you know like a, a bend like this basically with the filter on the back i thought that would maybe improve things and in all honesty it didn't so that's something that actually didn't change anything and of course if we close the hood then of course my new setup should be uh, sucking in less hot air so it should be also more consistent i'm not sure if there will be more performance but i will suffer less from heat soak if you see what i mean so yeah in the in the end uh, maybe just one thing i wanted to tell you also is i was expecting to make gains by going in a certain direction when adjusting the VVTLI, I was thinking the bigger the number VVTI angle, the more uh, power or more performance would uh, come in. And actually I realized the farther I pushed it out, the less power I had. And then suddenly I thought, okay, let's try to go in the opposite direction. And in the end, the smaller the number, the more power I made. And then I ended up at something like at, I forget, 20 or 25. And maybe I can even go further down, but there is a quite a big variance between, you know, within the VVT-LI uh, big cam area. I could push over the, the, the graph to the left, so increase the power on the big cam. That's really the important part because my car, when I'm on track and running hard, will always should always be on the big cam. I will hardly be on the small cam anymore if my transmission and my... A power band is long enough to be able to run constantly on it and that's how the car will be the fastest so see there is still some things to check in real life conditions on the circuit and everything so anyway i hope this video uh, helped gave you a little bit of insight into what it is to tune a 2zz i hope you enjoyed it for all of those who didn't please feel free to subscribe if you have questions in that regard please leave a comment below I am happy to answer within, within reason, of course, because I'm not an engineer either. And so maybe to give you something to look forward to next week, I'm going to blend in a little sequence now. Just so you know, I have inscribed myself to a time attack race with the MR2 a few weeks ago. And to say the least, it was very rich in emotions highs and lows whatever it, it sounds very dramatic what i'm telling you but you can definitely look forward to the next episode because things did not go at all as planned and was a very big learning experience so anyway thank you so much for watching and make sure not to miss next week's episode because it's gonna be really good thanks a lot see you next week peace